in your Bible, Psalm chapter 9 and verse 17. And uh, once you've found that verse, I encourage you to stand with me for the reading of the Word of God tonight. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 17. It says there very simply, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Let's bow in prayer. Father and God, we thank you and we praise you tonight. Lord, for who you are, we thank you for your goodness and your grace in our lives. Lord God, as we come together this evening, we pray that you would quiet our hearts and our minds, that you would help us to focus in on that which the Holy Spirit of God desires to say to us tonight. Lord, I pray also that you would help me as I preach. Lord, I'm nothing without you. And I need your enabling. I need you to speak through me. Lord, help me be nothing more than your, or nothing less than your messenger proclaiming your message. Lord, we just pray that you would go before us tonight. Lord, we just thank you. We praise you for who you are in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. I want us to, as we begin this evening, I want you to imagine that, you're, that you go for a little drive in your car. Now, I was going to say initially that we were going to all pile into a bus tonight, but I don't know if that's COVID friendly yet. So we're, let's say that we're going to go for a drive in our car, and that we're going to drive for 27 kilometers. Now, this is real easy for me because basically it's 26 kilometers to my house. So I have a real easy time picturing how, how far this is. But we're going to drive for 27 kilometers in your car, and in that 27 kilometer drive, you're going to see 247 road signs that say, warning, the bridge is out ahead. Statement, if you get to kilometer chapter 28 and you fall in a big hole, you've got a problem. Because you've been told 247 times in 27 kilometers that there was a bridge out ahead. Don't you think in that amount of time and that amount of travel, if you were to see that, that sign that many times, that it would catch your attention and that something would get through in your mind and say, hey, I need to be careful. There's a bridge that's out ahead. Hopefully they would get your attention. As a matter of fact, the whole reason why they would go to this whole extreme of setting up 247 signs would be for that purpose, to get your attention, to help you realize and understand the simple truth that there's a bridge overhead. Now, we've got a guy here tonight that works for DOT. I'm pretty sure they probably don't actually set up 247 signs before you come into an area where there's a washout or things of that nature. But there's a reason tonight why I chose that number. In the Word of God, in the New Testament Scriptures, there are 27 books. There are 247 warning signs in the New Testament that tell us there is a place called hell. 247 times in the New Testament Scriptures, we see that by inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, that God warns us that there is a place called hell. As a matter of fact, even in the Old Testament Scriptures, you can see it many times. And I, and I did some research as I was thinking about this. And of course, we know that there are 66 books in the Word of God. There are 791,328 words. I didn't count them. My computer counted them for me. That's one of the wonderful things about computer programs now. But there's 791,328 words, and I'm one of those preachers that believe that every single word in this book is the Word of God. Amen. That, friends, this is not just a book where, you know, well, some people say, well, the Bible contains the Word of God. No, friends, the Bible is the Word of God. Right. And there's a vast difference. I'm not going to take time to go into it tonight, but if you want me to take a minute afterwards and let you know what the difference is between the Bible contains the Word of God and the Bible is the Word of God, you come and I'll explain the difference to you after. But the liberals today would say the Bible contains 
the Word of God. No, friends, this book is the Word of God from cover to cover. The Bible makes it very clear that what we have in front of us is the inspired, inerrant, infallible, preserved words of the living God, every single one of them. And in the 27 books of the New Testament, 247 times, the Bible tells us very clearly that there is a place called hell. Mm. Now, I understand that we're living in 2022. And I understand that hell is not a popular subject in the world that we live in. I understand that there are people around who don't want to talk about hell. I understand that there are people that call themselves preachers who don't want to preach on hell. But friends, let me remind you this evening, the Bible has much to say about this subject of hell. As a matter of fact, do you know that for every time Jesus spoke about heaven, he spoke about hell twice. The Bible makes it very clear in this verse that we read this evening that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. The Bible makes it very clear to us that all people who have not received the gift of the grace of God when they die will go to hell. And friends, it's sad, but it's true. There's a scarcity of preaching on hell today. And friends, we need preachers who will continue to proclaim in this world that we live in that there is a heaven to gain and that there is a hell to shine. And friends, as we stop and as we think about this tonight, it's sad, but true, that hell is almost, in many churches today, it's a forgotten subject of the Bible. I was on the road. I can't even remember where I was now, but I can remember what I heard after the service. I preached a message on hell out of the book of Matthew, and somebody came up to me afterwards, and they said, I can't remember the last time that I heard a message on the subject of hell. Mm -hmm. Friends, as a preacher, God has called me to not preach my opinions or my thoughts, but to preach the whole counsel of God. Right. He's called me to preach what he is that the Holy Spirit of God places upon my heart. Hey, I want to take some time tonight to think a little bit on this perspective of hell to do a couple of things. First of all, to challenge us as believers to understand that one of the reasons that we're sharing our faith is because we really are concerned about where people spend eternity and we don't want to see them spend eternity in hell. And that's one of the reasons why that we want to look at this tonight because as a child of God, I want to remind you what the faith is of those who do not know Jesus Christ should they not trust Him as Lord and Savior. The second reason I want to look at it is for this simple reason. That if there was somebody under the sound of my voice this evening that has never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, we need to understand that there's not only a, an eternal heaven, but there is an eternal hell right. as well. I've had people ask the question before, and it's interesting, you ever notice how sometimes people don't really believe in the God of the Bible, but they make a God that suits them. Yeah. Yeah. You may talk about something that the Bible teaches and they say, well, my God wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you make a God that fits you. You make a God that, that suits you, a God that you're comfortable with. Friends, that's not the God that the Word of God teaches about. But beyond that, sometimes I've had somebody ask me the question, well, how can a loving God send someone to hell? Chances are, if you've spent any time witnessing it all, you've probably had that question or a question that is very similar to it asked to you. Friends, can I say this evening, God has done all that he can do to make sure that you don't go to hell. Mm -hmm. He loves you 
in spite of who you are, to the point that he went to the cross of Calvary for your sin and to take the punishment for your sin. But the bottom line is this. You need to choose whether you're going to accept or whether you're going to reject Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The truth of the matter is this. If somebody goes to hell, it's because they've chosen to reject Jesus Christ. And the only, re the only other alternative to, alternative to that is that I pay for my own sin forever in an eternal hell. And please understand when I talk about hell this evening, and we're not going to get into great study on this, but I do understand that hell is, is the place that people go to until they stand before God. And the Bible makes it very clear to us that really when it comes to eternity, that after the great white throne judgment, that they are cast into the lake of fire. So sometimes I may use the term hell this evening, but friends, I'm, I'm, I'm very clear. You don't need to come up to me afterwards and, and tell me the difference between hell and the lake of fire. I, I know that. But the characteristics that are true of one are true of the other. And friends, as we look at these passages, we'll find these things out. You see, friends, anyone, basically what needs to happen is this. In order for someone to go to hell, they need to reject what Jesus Christ has done for them in order to go there. That's why... And, and I've already taken one dig at him, but I can't help but do it one more time. That's why anybody that believes what John Calvin teaches needs to compare what they believe with the Word of God. Amen. Friends, God did not pick some to go to heaven and some to go to hell, and there's absolutely nothing that you can do if you're in the other camp. Actually, I'll be honest with you, and, and, and I'll go one step further than I would go sometimes and say this. It amazes me that there are Baptists that would even stand with John Calvin. John Calvin hated Baptists. He killed Baptists. But yet there are Baptists today that for whatever reason want to stand with him and his corrupt doctrine. And one of the reasons why churches, some churches, especially Calvinist churches, are dead today is because why should we go out? The ones that are going to be saved are going to be saved and the ones that are going to be lost are going to be lost. If that's how God predestined it. It's interesting to talk to those people. Friends, Jesus Christ did not die for the sins of the elect people. He died for the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. There are those who do believe I don't know if we've got any of them around here or not, directly in Amherst. But there are those who do believe that Jesus died for a certain <laughs> group. One of the things that's interesting when you're running into people that believe that is they are always in that group. <laughs> yeah. Man, I'm so glad that I don't have a daisy kind of God. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. Get to the last peril. Does he love me or does he not love me? Friends, I don't have to wonder. The Bible makes it abundantly clear. Amen. And I'm glad <coughs> that God's not in the picking and choosing business. Because let's be honest. I don't need to tell you this, but there's nothing fancy about me. And if God only picked certain people, careful, brother, that wasn't the place to say amen. <laughs> if God was only picking the elite and the elect, he just skipped right over me. But I'm glad that my Bible makes it very clear that Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, let him that hear us say, come, and whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life for him. 
Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friends, that's one of the wonderful things about witnessing. Because you can rest assured in advance that you're never going to talk to a person that God does not love and for whom Jesus Christ has not died. Amen. Friends, if you stand before God, if you reject God when you stand before him, you will be without excuse. He has done all that he can do. Friends, if you go to hell, you will go there as a trespasser. Remember that ultimately hell was made for the devil and his angels. Friends, it's not his desire for you to perish. It's not his desire that you would go to an eternal hell. He loves you and he desires salvation for you. But at the same time, if I can put it this way, God is a gentleman and he does not force himself or a relationship with himself upon people who do not want that relationship. But if you choose to reject him, then you must choose to accept what comes with the rejection of the Savior. Amen. And next, the eternal hell. Friends, it's not God's will for you to go to hell. But the flip side of that is this. The wicked shall be turned into hell in all the nations that forget God. I want you to come with me tonight to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. I want to show you some things about hell tonight from this passage. And we're going to go to a few other passages in the Word of God as well. Sadly, as I've already said, these facts are facts that are overlooked in many churches today. But friends, I'm a firm believer that if there is a doctrine that must be proclaimed in the day and age that we live in, it is the doctrine of hell. There are many churches that have forgotten about it. There are many Preachers that do not preach on it. And friends, we are not the better because of it. And we need to remember what the Word of God teaches about these things. But let, let's just go uh, to Luke chapter 16. Let me read verses 19 through 31 for you this evening. It says, There was a certain rich man, Luke 16, 19, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be filled, or fed rather, with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And saying, Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send them to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Yea, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. The first thing I want us to see from this passage tonight very simply is this. I want us to see hell's reality. Hell is a real place. Mm. Now, some, some may say, well, preacher, you can just stop right there because I don't believe that hell is real, so you don't really need to tell me about the fact that hell is a real place. Let me tell you something, friends. Just because you don't believe that hell is a real place will not make it one degree cooler when we get there. I can believe that a stove isn't hot and that it wouldn't burn me, but that wouldn't change the fact. I could walk off a bridge and say, I don't believe I'm going to fall, but that isn't going to change what the facts are. 
And friends, just not believing in a hell doesn't make hell any cooler or any less eternal. The Bible makes it very clear there is a hell. And I know that there are people in our world today that do not believe in hell. I know that there are even religious organizations that don't believe in hell. There are others that have twisted the doctrine of hell. But let me just say tonight, I'm going to side with God and with what God says in His Word. Amen. The Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. Friends, just because one denies the existence of hell does not mean that hell is not real. And just because one denies its existence does not mean that it is not true. I want to show you some things about, from this passage, some observations. Notice in verse 19 of Luke 16, it says this. Says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. So if you're looking at some things about the reality of hell here, I want you to notice first of all tonight, he was a rich man that's talked about in this passage. It's we know that he was a rich man because of a number of reasons in verse 19. First of all, you ready for this? This is deep. You might want to write this down if you're taking notes. We know that he was a rich man. Because the Bible tells us he was a rich man. There was a rich man, it says. So the Bible says he was rich, so therefore we know he was rich. That's really the end of the statement there. But beyond that, there's other evidences that this man that's being talked about in this passage is a rich man. Notice it says in verse 19 that there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple. If you're familiar with purple at all, especially in Bible times, you know that purple is the color of royalty and riches. The reason why he was wearing purple was so that the people around him would understand that he was a rich man, that he had lots of money. So we know he was rich because the Bible says he was rich. We know he was rich because he was wearing purple. And we know he was rich because the Bible said that he fared sumptuously every day. You know what that means? It means that when he sat down and thought, you know what, I'd like to have. I'd like to have, so I'm going to go get it. You ever thought of something that you'd like to have if you had lots of money, but you don't have because you don't have the money? <laughs> this was a guy, when the Bible says that he fared sumptuously every day, what he's saying is this. This guy, if he wanted it, he went and got it because he was rich. So we see that he was a rich man, but I want you to understand something. Because sometimes people get the wrong idea from this passage. The rich man did not go to hell because he was rich. And the poor man did not go to heaven because he was poor. The rich man went to hell because he did not know Jesus Christ. And the poor man went to heaven because he was saved by the grace of God. He had a relationship with the God of the universe. But I believe that one of the reasons why they make it clear that this rich man went to hell was to remind us of the simple truth that contrary to what some religions would tell you, you cannot buy your way into heaven. Amen. Because friends, your way into heaven has already been purchased by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. What can you pay when everything's already been paid? As a matter of fact, for me to say, well, Lord, I want to pay this, or I want to do this in order to be right with you. Yes, I may believe that Jesus is God and that he died on the cross for my sins, but I want to add this, or I want to add that. You know what you're doing? You're insulting God. You're saying what you did on the cross was not enough. I got to add this to it. I got to add that to it. And friends, everything that we bring to the table is corruptible. We've been redeemed with incorruptible things. The precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he had the rich man had all he ever wanted. But he didn't have Christ. And the Bible says when he died, he went to hell. Because he didn't have the one thing that matters. 
Or should I say the one that matters, and that's Jesus Christ. Regardless, friends, of who you are, we already talked about this last night, but can I just be gloom and doom for a second again? I don't care if you wind up being the mayor of Amherst or the prime minister of Canada. Just for the record, if any of you decide to run, I, I vote for you. Especially over what we got right now. But it doesn't matter who you are. Someday, death is going to come knocking on your door. Two things in life are sure, death and taxes. We don't know when death's coming, but we know it's coming. I pastored for 18 years. I've been involved in all aspects of burials through the course of my life, from preaching a funeral to digging a grave to filling in a grave. I've done it all. And you know what I found out? doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are. Everybody's hole in the ground is the same size. You're not going to take it with you. And beyond that, Friends, what matters is not that I have what I want down here, but what matters is that I'm prepared when eternity comes. And the only one who can prepare me for that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only was he a rich man, but I see also in this passage that he was a religious man. Verse 24 of Luke 16, it says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. He knew the Old Testament law well. He knew about Abraham. He knew who Abraham was. There's only one way to know that, friends, and that's by studying the Old Testament scriptures. So this was a man that knew all kinds of things about the Bible or what part, the part of the Bible that was available to him at that time. He was a man who was very religious, but the problem with that is this. And friends, this is a problem that needs to be reiterated in 2022. And let me tell you this. There are people who live in this world that this does not set well with. But again, what, the, what matters is what saith the scriptures. This guy was a religious man, but listen carefully, friends. Listen carefully because millions in this world have been deceived. Religion is not what gets you to heaven. Right. You can be religious, but lost. Religious, but not right with God. You say, well, with re if religion will not get me to heaven, what is it that gets me to heaven? What gets you to heaven is a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not religion, it is salvation. And you say, well, preacher, you're talking about the same thing when you say religion and salvation. You're using synonyms, synonyms here. Oh, no, I'm not, friends. There is a big difference between religion and a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible makes that abundantly clear to us. Friends, religion... Is man trying to get to God? Now, there's people that have all kinds of different ideas about how they do that. But if you put religion in a big pot and boil it down, religion is man trying to get to God. Whether it's through a pilgrimage, whether it's through a baptism, whether it's through a church membership, whether it's through giving, whether it's through teaching their religion to others, whatever it is, but it's do this, do this, do this, do this, and through doing this, there's a hope that maybe just possibly, and notice there's never an assurance. There's a hope that maybe just possibly you could get to God. None of them can tell you this is how you know when you've arrived. So religion is man trying to get to God, a relationship with Jesus Christ, or what the Bible talks about as salvation is this. It is me understanding as a man that there's absolutely nothing that I can do to get to God, and that even all of the good things that I do are like filthy rags before a holy God, and because I can't get to God, God came to man in the person of Jesus Christ and died upon a cross to pay for my sin so that through his death I can have 
eternal life. Religion is man trying to get to God. Salvation is God came to man in the person of Jesus Christ and made a way. Big difference. Religion is based upon what can I do. Salvation is based on the fact it is finished. The price has been paid. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Here was a man who was very religious, but he was very lost in his sin. Friends, can I say this? It doesn't matter what religion you are. If you aren't blood washed, According to the word of God, you're headed to hell. Can I shock you just a little bit? I'm just not talking to cults tonight. Do you know that you can go to hell from the seat of Amherst Open Bible Baptist Church mm -hmm. just as easy as you can go to hell from some place that doesn't teach the truth? Because mm -hmm. let me tell you something, friends. This place cannot save you. Amen. That's right. We can point you to the one who can, Amen. but we can't save you. Friends, it is not what you are that saves you. It is what it is who you know that saves you. Sometimes we talk about the plan of salvation. And I know what people are getting at, but really, if you want to get right down to brass tacks, it's the person of salvation mm -hmm. that we're talking about. It's all about Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Then notice in, back in Luke 16, verses 24 through 26, and says, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in his flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforting, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you Catch this. Cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from things. This is one of the clearest passages in all of the word of God that shows us that one of the doctrines that's taught by some religions today is not true. And the doctrine is this. There are those who will teach. Well, if you get, if you die without Jesus Christ, there's a third option. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go to heaven. You can go to somewhere else. Some would call it purgatory. Mm -hmm. And it's not eternal separation from God. Eventually, if your loved one's given, uh, given up or do this or do that, then you'll be all right. Now, that's not what the Bible teaches. Mm -hmm. The Bible teaches there's only two options. Heaven and hell. And the Bible makes it very clear, friends, and you can see it in verses 24 through 26 that we just read, that when, after you die, there is no changing of destinations. It's too late once life here is done. The choice on where I'm going to spend eternity must be made this side of eternity. And let me go one step further and say this. I never know when I'm stepping from time into eternity. That's why it's dangerous to presume upon the grace of God. Isaiah says, call ye upon the Lord while he is near. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Proverbs 27, 1 says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Friends, if you die without Jesus Christ, you will be eternally separated from the presence of God. Let me just go back and, and read a scripture for you. You can stay if you want in Luke 16, but I want to read something for you out of Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59 and verses 1 and 2. It says this, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy, 
They cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Friends, we can't come on the basis of our own goodness. The only way that we can come to, G to, to God is through Jesus Christ. The Bible says that there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man. And it's not Danny Jack. It's not Paul Parks. It's not some guy that dresses like a father and wants to be called mother, or dresses like a mother and wants to be called father. It's not any religious leader. It is Christ Jesus. He's the only one Amen. that can take the hand of God in one hand and the hand of man in the other hand and bring the two together. Amen. Friends, I'm just not telling you what I think tonight. I'm showing you what the Word of God says. The Bible says there's an eternal hell where there's separation from God. And eternal, when it speaks of it, here's the amazing thing. There are people, even preachers, that if you listen to what they're saying, they believe in an eternal heaven, but not an eternal hell. By the way, there's an abundance of evidence, and I'm, I don't want to step on anybody's toes tonight, but there's an abundance of evidence that Billy Graham was one of those guys. He did not believe in the eternal hell. But here's the catch. As a child of God tonight, do you rejoice in the eternal heaven? No. The fact that Heaven is forever. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Here's the catch. If you want to believe in the eternal heaven, and you should because that's what the Bible teaches, then you must believe in the eternal hell. Mm -hmm. Because the exact same word that is used in the Bible to describe the duration of heaven is the same word that is used to describe the duration of hell. They're both described as eternal and everlasting. So, friends, I got news for you. If heaven, if hell is not eternal, then based on your conclusion, heaven is not eternal. Then you got two major problems with what the Word of God teaches. Friends, the Bible teaches very clearly that there is an eternal hell. Then come to verses 27 and 28 of Isaiah 16. It says, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wilt send them to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Once again, in this verse, I see something that very clearly teaches something contradictory to what a lot of people think. Do you ever hear somebody say, I want to go to hell because that's where all my friends are going to be? I want to go to hell because that's where the party is going to be for eternity. I like what Brother Osteen says. He says that fire, the, the, the party in hell has been canceled because of the fire. You know what you see here? I'll tell you what I see in this verse. Contrary to popular belief, there's not one person in hell that wants to be there when they get there. That's right. He says very clearly to them. He said, L listen, if it, was, if it was a place where the party was, if it was, a, if it was a place where people today like to make it, you think it is, don't you think he'd want his brothers to come and join him? But all of a sudden he's there and he says, listen, he says, somebody please go to my father's house because I've got brethren and I don't want them to come to this place where I am. Friends, that sounds like hell is quite different than what many people in the world today point uh, paint hell to be. But once again, friends, I'm not going to stand on what people think. I'm going to stand on what God says. Amen. And the Bible makes it very clear, friends, that there's not one person that is in hell tonight who wants any company. Here is a man that before he died, he had absolutely no concern whatsoever about where he was going or where anybody else was going. But now that he is in hell, he has a burden for his brothers. I don't want them to come here. Then we see in verses 29 and 30. 
He says, Abraham saith unto them, They have Moses and the prophets, let them, delete, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, notice this, they will repent. Ooh, there's another doctrine people don't like talking about today. It's a sad thing. Stop and think about this. People in hell believe in repentance. But yet we've got yellow valley compromising preachers yeah. that don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah. Friends, the Bible makes it very clear. And I want you to understand this clearly tonight. And this is straight from the word of God. If you have never turned from your sin and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, you will die in your sin and go to hell. I don't care how many sinners prayers you pray. I don't care how many times you've been baptized or if you're a member of every Bible preaching church in the country. Friends, if you've never turned from your way to God's way and trusted Jesus Christ, then you've never been saved by the grace of God. Friends, this man now believes in repentance now that he is in hell. People who say there's no such thing will believe in it one day, friends, when they wind up there as well. And we ask the question, is repentance essential? Is repentance necessary? Well, friends, don't let me answer that question for you. How about we let the Lord answer that question? Amen. In Luke chapter 13, not once but twice. Verse 3 and verse 5. You know, when God says something, you ought to listen. But when he says something twice, especially close together, he's trying to get your attention. Yeah. And he says this in Luke 13, verses 3 and 5. He says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Sounds to me like repentance is pretty essential. Verse 31, it says, And he said unto them, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. By the way, one did rise from the dead. And they weren't persuaded. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, If they won't believe the word of God, and what God has said, the witness of himself in this book, if they don't believe what God has said, then there's not a person that can come along that will persuade them otherwise. Because, friends, this is what makes the difference, the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And he talks about Moses and the prophets here, referring to what they had then, the Old Testament Scriptures. Friends, if people won't hear and heed the Word of God, they can't be saved. Matters not who the messenger is. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is key to somebody being saved. Friends, I'm here to tell you tonight, hell is just as real as a building you're sitting in this evening. But let me give you a couple more thoughts very quickly. Come back to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And verse 28. It says there, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Friends, I want you to understand something tonight. The fire in hell will not be quenched. And contrary to what some would say, it's not just, and we'll look at this in just a moment, just in case you don't believe me, because I don't want you to take what I say, I want you to take what God says. It's not just one of these deals where somebody goes to hell and they, they suffer for a little bit and then they're burned up and that's the audience, and both friends, that, that's not what happens. The Bible makes it very clear that it's an agony that never stops. Friends, it doesn't matter what people say. Hell is an awful place. It is a place of torment. Come to uh, Mark chapter 9.
Mark chapter 9. I got good news for you. I'm closer to finish than I was when I started. Mark 9, verse 43. Let's get a couple of things here very quickly. Mark 9, 43. It says this. And by the way, you might want to pay attention to what's being said in these verses. It says, first of all, and if thy hand offend thee, cut off, it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to enter into hell. And notice this, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off, it is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into, the, into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You see something, friends, that he's trying to get across here? He's making it very clear that in hell the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. And over and over again, he says, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Now, please don't uh, get to the place and say, well, what's he talking about? He talks about the hand and the foot and the eye. We don't have time to go into it in great detail, but let me say this. He's saying this. Whatever <coughs> object it is, that entices you to sin. The preventative is not to stay as close to it as you can. If it entices you to sin, what he's saying is this. Turn away from it, get away from it, and cut that off from yourself. And friends, we need to understand that your criteria for it all is whether or not a person knows Jesus Christ. It's not based on what I've done. The same hell where the person that's been a mass murderer is there for eternity is the same hell that houses a Sunday school teacher that didn't know Jesus Christ. It's the same hell that houses that church leader that didn't know Jesus Christ. Let me give you a verse. Matthew chapter 7. You're probably familiar with it, but Matthew chapter 7. Verses 21 through 23. Not everyone, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now what is this? Many will say, to me in that day. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in equity. You see, the Bible tells us very clearly that there's going to be pretenders. People that pretend they're <coughs> saved, but they're not. And it's not based on what I do. You see what? The only thing that mattered there, it didn't matter that they cast out devils, that they taught people, that they'd done this and they'd done that. The only thing that mattered was this. I never knew you. Friends, there's no escape from hell. Let me give you one more verse and then we'll <coughs> nail this thing shut for tonight. Hebrews, uh, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 actually talks about the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15 says, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Logos didn't matter who they were. Small and great, the unsaved stood before God. And the books were opened. And the other book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books according to their works. We don't have time to get into this according to the works deal. But I believe it comes to actually show that there's degrees of punishment. And it says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. 
Notice this, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Here's my final thought for tonight. Hell is not for five seconds. Hell is not for five minutes. Hell is not for five hours or five weeks or five years. Hell is forever. The Bible makes it very clear that hell is an eternal place. It's a place of complete torment for all eternity. Let's just flip the coin for a moment, Christian. We're looking forward to heaven. Not because of who we are, but because of Jesus Christ and what he's done. Because we've got a simple faith in a great God. And friends, I'll be honest with you, I'm looking forward to getting to heaven. I'm looking forward to sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and listening to him proclaim this book. I'm looking forward to the worship of him. I'm looking forward to the music in heaven around the throne of God. I even believe that I'll be able to sing on key when I get to heaven. I'm looking forward to being able to serve him for all of eternity. I'm looking forward to all the beauty and the wonder that the Bible talks about when it talks about heaven. And friends, I want you to understand something tonight. In heaven, I'm not going to be the center of attention. And neither are you. It's all about him. It's all about him. Friends, we'll worship him. We'll cast our crowns at his feet. We'll get to sit at his feet. We will get to serve him. And we're going to do it for all of eternity. And one of the best things, I don't know if I should say one of the best things, but one of the best things is that when we go to the other side, we leave these robes of flesh behind forever. Not only are we in the presence of the Savior, and there's no more sickness, and there's no more death, and there's no more sorrow, friends, there's no more sin. Amen. You're never going to have to worry about locking your door in heaven. You're never going to have to worry about somebody walking up behind you and doing something that they shouldn't do. Because you'll be in heaven. You'll be in home for all of eternity. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're not at home right now, but we will be someday. We've got the promise that he's going to come again for us. And friends, we'll enjoy the beauty and the splendor of that for all of eternity. But Christian, I want you to think about something tonight. Just as long as you spend with Jesus rejoicing, your lost loved ones are going to be in hell in torment. The same amount of time that we go to heaven, friend, if you don't know Jesus Christ, it's the same amount of time that you'll go to hell if you die without God. It's sad, I've talked to people before that aren't saved and they're so close to getting saved and they, their hold back is, what are people going to think of me? What's my family going to think if I trust Christ? Let me tell you something, friends. I would not go to hell for what somebody else thinks of me. Well, you know, I've been around a church all my life. What in the world would somebody think if I get saved? Hmm. Let me tell you what they think. They'd be happy. Yep. They'd be excited. And if they didn't get happy and excited, it would be because they need the same thing that you just got. That's right. Because Christians rejoice when people get saved. Amen. Good. And friends, I believe that tonight sinners need to see Calvary. Need to see our sin. It separates us from a holy God. And there's absolutely nothing that we can do 
to save ourselves and say, thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you for doing for me what I could not do for myself. And by faith, as best I know how, I'm turning from my sin and I'm trusting Jesus Christ to save me. And I'll be honest, not only, do Christ, not only do the lost need to see Calvary, but I believe, friends, with all my heart, that the child of God needs to get a fresh glimpse of hell and get a burden for the lost. And friends, I hope that tonight what happens is that some of us who are here who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, that before this night is over, that we'll swallow our pride and we'll fall on our face before God and we'll say, God, give me a burden for the lost like I've never had before. And friend, if you're here tonight and you've never been saved by the grace of God, let me say this. I care where you spend eternity. I'd love to be able to sit down with you or somebody else that's here that knows the word of, knows Christ and knows the word of God, that you know knows them. They'd love to sit down with you and take this book and show you not what we think and not necessarily, you know, just what we have in our church constitution because that really doesn't matter. What we want to show you is what does God say in this book right here about your life, about eternity, about heaven, and about hell. Friends, we'd love to take the time to sit down with you and show you from the pages of the Word of God how you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christ is your Savior, that your sins are forgiven, that he's brought purpose and joy and fulfillment, and when life is all over, heaven too. And friends, the Bible says that these things have been written that you might know that you have eternal life. Friend, let me ask you tonight, do you know? If you say, well, I think so, or I hope so, that's the wrong answer. Because the Bible says you can know. Hmm. Salvation is not a hope so thing, and it's not a think so thing. It's I know whom I have believed. Christian, it's time that we understand the consequences of not sharing our faith. Father, we pray that tonight that you give every one of us a fresh glimpse of hell. Lord, for the lost, may we understand what's at stake and may we be driven to the word of God to find out the truth because eternity is way too long to make a wrong choice. And Lord, for the Christian, <coughs> help us to understand what's at stake. The souls of men and women and children and where they will spend eternity is on the line. And you've left us here, Lord, to proclaim to the world that there is a remedy and his name is Jesus Christ. Mm. Lord, we pray that by your grace that we be faithful to do what you've called us to do. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.